trying to reach all of them is, is near impossible. So I made a, a lot more specific subcategories. So there were graphic designers who were using, were, were using it for files, but then they were also asking for features that allowed them to do more video. So more video, more music in some cases. And so there were a lot of these features that were coming in from that. You know, videographers, wedding photographers, medical professionals. And this seems a little bit out of place, parents with young kids. And that's because um, there are a few other categories here I kind of short on this list. Um, but at around this time, I also had my first child, and I observed firsthand some of the pains that my wife was going through around uh, file and video sharing, particularly. And so I figured that that would be one of the things that I will also experiment with. And I had a perfect customer, which was my wife at the time, so you know, starting a new car. So that's the example that I'll walk through here today. So I started to study with that, with, with that particular example. So we want to sketch multiple canvases, and so these are some rules of how you do it. So when you're doing these things, you want to sketch them in one sitting. So unlike a business plan where you're writing you know, maybe a chapter over several weeks and you're doing a lot of research, what the canvas is about is really doing a brain dump. So what's in your head right now, right this instant, and putting it down on paper. It's okay with the section blank. You're not going to have all the answers. And actually, if you think about it, that's actually a good thing because when you leave things blank, it's telling you that you don't quite know the answer, and that's an indication that that's something that's risky. You should probably go find that answer first before something you're sure of fits on that model. And then you want to think in the present. So again, in the business model, you think all these 18 month, you know, five year forecasts, which are really exercises in fiction um, because it's impossible to predict that far. What we want to do here is think more in the present. So one of the first things that I do when I look at any particular product is I try to figure out the runway for me to get that product in front of a customer. So I'm looking at just what it's going to take me to build my first minimum viable product out, and do I have enough resources to do it? If not, where do I get those resources from? So I'm not looking out you know, three years from now, I'm just looking at a much shorter horizon. And when I get there, based on the learning, I can make another set of um, uh, planning for the, for the next milestone that we want to hit. So there are, these, there are these smaller jumps rather than having this big jump. Because again, the point of the canvas is that it's an evolving document. It's not there to show what the company will look like five years from now, but more accurately what it will look, look like next week and for the week after, or at least at most one or two, three months from now. So I already mentioned that I tend to take a more customer-centric approach to the canvas. So everything is driven by that customer box. So that's the one that I usually play with, but you can play with a lot, any single one of the boxes once you have a canvas and you can start tweaking, say, your revenue streams or your cost structure, um, figure out alternate models as well. Now, the prescribed model that I saw, unfortunately, I didn't build the original canvas, so I couldn't lay it out the way I wanted, and I, I didn't want to respect the original one because it is, it does have, uh, it does have value and it is one that's recognized, so I kept that original mm -hmm. shape but I, I have a particular order that I told the job with the order we'll take. And if you're using the tool, there's some numbers there as well, so you can kind of follow along with that. The first place where I start is the problem and customer segment, and I find that they go hand in hand, so I, I tend to treat them together. So I start by listing the top one to three problems that I have for this particular uh, problem that I'm building. And I would list the existing alternatives. The existing alternatives are how I think these products are being solved today. So where, what do I think these customers are using today? Now, this is a very interesting thing. I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit more. Because sometimes the existing alternative is not even what we would consider an immediate competitor. So when people, at one point I was building a collaborative, you know, I was building collaboration software. And because we were doing it in this peer-to-peer -peer fashion, I felt like I had no competitors because we were doing it so differently and there wasn't really anyone that was solving that problem this particular way. Um, until I realized that our real challenge wasn't even a competitor, but it was just email. Everyone just would just source the email for collaboration, they resort to email for almost everything, which ended up being the most common denominator. And as we see on the photo sharing side, email ended up being like the biggest alternative that we had to go up against. Not Facebook, not Snuggler, not Flickr, it was actually email. Um, so, so thinking about the existing alternatives is very important because that, again, is where we're going to position again. So if you know that people are using email and email is free, then you've got to come up with a value proposition that is much better than email. And it's, it's not only better feature-wise, but it's one that can justify paying for a good charge for your product or add some other benefit over, over that alternative. 
and then you want to identify other user roles on the canvas as well. So sometimes, so, so even though you may have customers and users, many times there are other types of users and different roles. So being able to see how they use the system is important. And when you're building a complex canvas, like a multi-sided um, model where you may have a marketplace, you have buyers and sellers, and you have advertisers, it, it may be useful to <coughs> build multiple canvases at that point. But I wouldn't necessarily start there. First, try to put everything on one. And if you just can't fit it because it is a kind of a limited format, then you might want to break it out if you are, if you are, if, if you have a touch point to all of those different types of users. Otherwise, focus purely on where, where the, the users are coming into your system uh, first. <coughs> and then we're going to narrow down even more and hone in on top of early adopters. So let's look at an example of uh, how I build it for, for cloud providers. So remember here that the, um, the, the customer is a, a parent with a, with a kid, and that is, the, that is the customer segment that I'm building this for. So the first problem I list is that sharing is a time-consuming uh, activity. So sharing lots of photos becomes time-consuming, but the problem that I really observed was around video. So at, around that time, iPhones were becoming very popular, and more people were taking videos. We were still taking more videos at home, but trying to then get them into the right format and uploading them was such a painful process that that was the first problem. <coughs> Secondly, parents have no free time. So if you have a young kid in the house, you know that you're going to be sleep deprived. And the last thing you want to do is be sharing lots of this photo and video. You have much better things to do with your time. And then the, what made it a perfect storm of problem in my mind was that at the same time, there was a lot of demand for this content. So we were getting bombarded sometimes, it felt like, um, for updates from grandparents, sometimes from my sister. They all live far away. And so they wanted to know, you know what the, the kids were looking like on a weekly basis sometimes. And we weren't getting enough sleep. And so that made it kind of interesting to say, let's, let's explore this further to see if there's something something worth solving here. So the existing algorithm I, I listed out Twitter, email, Twitter, Plasma, Facebook, and all of these photo, photo video sharing sites. And I put email on there. And as I mentioned early on, is that first I thought there'd be a few people using email. But once we went and interviewed people, we <coughs> that was actually 60% of what people were using, even though it was hugely limiting, they couldn't stand. And many of the people were, were, were weren't even um, even downsizing these pictures, so they weren't like savvy enough to figure out how to resize them, or they were just didn't care. They were just sending one or two pictures at a time, and there would be 10 emails with this with this huge like eight nine pictures in them. Um, so that's just how people were using it because it was much simpler to build, and it was faster, and it was convenient. So on the customer segment side, I list out parents, those would be the creators, that's the user role, and I kind of tag them as. And I list family and friends, and those would be viewers of the, the album. And then the early adopter, and this kind of didn't occur to us till after a few interviews, and so I'm, I'm, instead of showing the iteration of this, I'm just jumping a little bit ahead. But when we first started out, we thought it would just be parents and young kids. And as we started interviewing people, we found out that it was more moms than dads that were doing the sharing. That was the first realization. And then the second thing with more interviews we found was that this much made it even more the first time moms with, with young children, with kids under the age of three. And the only way we were able to kind of rationalize that is that the, when you have a first child with such a you know, magical addition to the family, that the moms are more motivated to share, but also there's more demand for it. So grandparents are want to see their first grandchild, and unfortunately, it doesn't carry over like all the other children after that. And so if you are in a second, mm -hmm. sorry, but that is how what we observe. And then the other thing we also found is that after a certain age, um, the kids either become less kids or people are just tired of, of pictures and so they start having as much of those demands. So that was our early adopters. First time moms with kids under the age of three, they were just, you know, they were sleep deprived, they didn't want to get this stuff out. So they were motivated to, to, to want to use something like some video that feature. So that generation the time is, is the unique value proposition. And I kind of refined this a little bit uh, in, in, in the book after, after this version. So, so this, is a, this is a very hard thing to get right because it's a single statement that you have to put out there that convinces someone that you are different. And rather than saying it works fine, and I think it's very hard to do that in a single statement, the, our bigger challenge is when we first started with getting noticed, getting, getting attention. Um, we, we live in, in such a you know, advertising bombarded society that that it is very hard for you to hit the landing page and really stop and say, wow, what are, what are these guys are building? So the, the landing page or the, the, the visibility proposition you put out 
Again, it's not about selling or about getting those. Rather than saying we're fine, I would kind of refine that and say it should be something that kind of works and sets people to pass. So what are some ways for building or crafting such a unique value proposition? So again, that's where going narrow is very, very useful. When you actually target early adopters, you, you, you pretty much have this idea of who the perfect customer is in your mind and actually talk directly to them. And it's much more effective to name people uh, and say this is a product for you and have a very watered down general message to their side. The other um, thing that's kind of helpful is focusing on finished story benefit. So for any of you who have had some marketing education, you probably know the probably heard of ways that should be focusing on on um, on benefits but not features. And this kind of takes that a little bit further to say if you look at a product and you want to get to that unique value proposition. Look at what, what the customer is going to feel after experiencing your product. So what is that finished story benefit? What are really what are they really happy with doing? So when you say you're on job orders, you might have a feature be something like um, you know upload your, uh, your your resume and we will we will come up with a professionally designed template that's unique to you. Right, that could be a feature. And the benefit would be that that resume stands out and is noticed by more people. But the finished story benefit is really why I'm doing this in the first place. Design my dream job. And so if I'm able to capture someone's attention to say, who's our website because we have more people capture or find their dream job, at least it gets me interested in this. It's presenting something that I'm, I'm after that's connected with me on a problem level. And then I might look to, so it doesn't necessarily sell the part, but it gives me permission to then, it gives them permission to then sell me on some of the features and benefits that they have to sell to us. So that's a good technique, and you'll see that apply here as well. So another thing that is pretty useful is creating what I call a high concept pitch. It's not something I invented. This has actually been used quite heavily in, uh, I think first started getting used in Hollywood. So this is a way that Hollywood profess, uh, producers would uh, distill down a, a plot of a movie down to a sound bite when they were pitching a movie to, to someone else. Um, so for example, if they were trying to pitch the movie Aliens, they might just say it's like Jaws only in space. So they're using two familiar terms and kind of just distilling down the idea. In the tech world, when YouTube was uh, just coming out, it would tell everyone we're just like Flickr only for videos. And so it's a very easy way to kind of get an idea across. So it's not a unique value proposition. You're obviously not going to put this on your landing page or your website, but it is something that once you have got a customer or once you have an interview, um, having that meme with them is a, a good way for having that idea spread you know, afterwards. So one thing we didn't really touch on is that when you do interview people, um, they, reach, they, they hit the point where it's, when it's hard to find people. So a very common tactic you use is asking for referrals. So after we finish an interview and we find a customer who is, um, who has, they've got a prospect who might be a potential uh, customer we want to bring on, we ask for referrals. And so one way of, of helping them understand and spread our idea is by giving them a high concept pitch. So these other two books I highly recommend. I don't know if anyone here read these books before or know them, The Allergies and How to Cook. Okay. Usually they're not even just seen them, but they were written back in the 70s. These are considered some of the fathers of modern advertising. And they've got some great, um, it's, it's very easy to read books, they kind of practice what they preach so they get right to the point. And some of these ideas are from there. And they have some other ideas on things like the power of words. So using single words to like um, define your positioning and brand are kind of important. And so even when you're doing interviews, you're listening for those particular keywords that customers use. And to just illustrate how powerful some of those words are, um, they, they, they are they, these words can be can, can, can actually define your, your branding and positioning. So if, I, if you look at the top three um, car manufacturers right now, they all use a single word to call position or brand itself. If I use Mercedes as an example, can anyone guess what that one word is that they use over and over again in their messaging and their branding? What do you think that word would be? Luxury. Yeah, luxury or prestige. If I say BMW, it would be performance. If I say Audi, it would be design. So those are the three words that they have begun, that they have been used for like many times to like build all their branding and, and marketing around. So words become important to help you define and to position yourself on that new value proposition as well. So I'm going to illustrate how we iterate it. So I mentioned many examples of saying, you know, we're going to experiment and learn qualitative and quantitative. So this is going to be a good example of showing kind of both approaches. <coughs> so 
This is the first version of the dynamic data that we built for Cloudfire. And so it was built mostly by engineers who came up with speed being the, uh, the unique advantage. And we also looked around and there are people who are doing high quality photos, there are others who are doing other types of benefits. So we thought ours was going to be all about speed because we could do this instant sharing. So we started out with the tagline of the fastest way to share your photos and videos, helping parents share their photos and videos instantly. When you have a two minute video, now we're going to screenshot what the product would look like and they want to see what that looks like. So that's how we started out. And then at the same time, I'm going to show you a bunch of var variations of how we then tweak it. So I showed, so I showed this to a handful show of moms and it didn't quite resonate with them. They said, this is, I don't see how this is different from what I use currently. Because what I use currently is you know, fast enough. And I said, well, how fast is it? And they said, well, you know, when you're sharing a, a few photos, it's, it's pretty fast. And order of minutes. <coughs> I asked for money to share, like, say, 100 photos or 500 at how fast is it? So I said, well, that obviously will take time. We're going to have to wait for the uploading and the and you know, that's, that's, that's hard. But what about when you do videos? And many of them didn't share videos because it was so painful because they have to kind of show, they have to upload. So they said, yeah, that was just too painful, but they still didn't see that coming across. And I said, well, what we also had in there was the word instantly. We said you can share your photos and videos instantly, which means save of time, which means Slide the folder and poof, you know, it's gone on the website live and the photos are shared. And I said, well, I didn't see that at all because instantly it's one of those overused marketing terms that has no way. And so that was kind of intriguing. So I actually went back and I did a search on Google and I, I kind of saw what they were talking about. I, I found this um, photo printing shop in Austin. It said, you know, wait while we print your photos instantly in 30 minutes. So to them, 30 minutes was <laughs> And so obviously that didn't, didn't carry any weight. So that's an example where we might think we are we're sending the right messaging, but it was not really sticking, but it didn't, didn't stand out enough. So we tried this version. So so I mentioned earlier on the words matter. So we so we, we took the busy parents, which was kind of not even the previous version, it was not even busy, we're just helping parents. We kind of used the word busy with any um, kind of prompt and or we put that as a headline. And then we also put that slash for so it said no uploading required. And we thought that would get attention because they, they couldn't not see it. And it sure enough when it got attention. People saw it and they paused and they asked questions. The problem is the reaction we got, we got two kinds of reactions and both of them were back. So let me show this to people who were somewhat technical. They looked at that and said, well, I don't understand how this would work. Can you explain it to me? Because I don't see how you can do this without uploading. And so we would spend about two or three minutes talking about the technology and what we build. And at the end, it's said, okay, I kind of see it. But, but, but when we saw people who were non-technical, they kind of did the same thing and said, I don't understand how this works. And it's just pretty scary. Like, how, how does this work? And they didn't quite trust it. So in that case, we get into a situation where we also went to a full team in a conversation and try to like, make them feel more comfortable. But both of those reactions were wrong because they required further explanation, which we couldn't do on a landing page. So if you were done with sort of face-to-face, -face, we could do it. But put this on a landing page and this is going to be a self-serve site, that wouldn't work. So they got attention, but the attention, the, the, the reaction after the attention would be people leaving the site because they don't trust it. And so that was not a good thing. So we went to the final version where we said, you know, it's too hard to talk about our target, but it is something new. We're trying to do this thing without uploading, which people are going to question and not understand. So let's take a different path altogether. And so this time we, we replaced that screenshot, which if you really think about it, it doesn't look like it doesn't look unlike any other photo sharing site. There's a bunch of pictures on there, right? And every photo sharing site has that. So there's nothing we're just taking up space. So we instead of just trying to connect with the with the customer. And let me show this to moms. The first thing it said, so that is me. So that is my wife. That's what I do like every day. I have a baby and I'm trying to type on the keyboard. So I was doing that in, in that instant connection with them. And that gave us permission to then allow them to keep come to this side of the screen and read everything on there. And then even there, we weren't really talking about the features and benefits and how great the start was. We went to that finished story benefit. It is the second line. It's saying get back to the more important things in your life faster. So we were, we were kind of connecting with them on a problem level. That this is something that is painful. You don't like doing it. That's who you are. And we, we can give you a solution. And that got their attention. That's what a good new product proposition should really do. And after that, the mode of gold this is where you can go and talk all about your product conversation with all of those kinds of things. But at that point, you have your attention. You, you want to learn more, you want to try your product. So 
And so before I move on, one other thing I want to illustrate with that is that while we were doing these interviews, I, at some point I took these, these three, three versions, and I also put them in a, um, I also ran split tests, so I drove some traffic to them um, using AdWords, uh, Facebook ads, and stumble upon. I started measuring results from you know, how people were, so I wanted to again verify this stuff quantitatively. I got a qualitative five out of five people saying that they prefer the third version, but not just saying that they were telling me why they liked it more than the others, and the reasons made a lot of sense. So that's the only thing I gave you I got from that. And so those are the two reactions I got. And it took me a week to get those interviews done, and that's my trying to conduct it. It took me a week for me to create these three versions and end up on this version which works. Now the same thing we, we ran on a we ran quantitatively, and it ran for three or four weeks. It was still not conclusive. So we were getting, we were driving all this traffic, and we have to convert for them to be counted. But for, for Google to declare a winner, uh, it has to be statistically significant. You have to have enough of a difference from the others. And it wasn't quite that clear over there, because we were getting people who were just clicking through. The more experienced part, though, is let me ask all the moms these five and then even all of them afterwards. How they started using their first process. So those that those that were um, not using email that were actually using a photo sharing site, and we asked them how they actually learned about that product. It was not through a Google ad or a Facebook ad. They all heard about it from someone else. It was through word of mouth. And so the main question on that channel that we thought we would be able to use AdWords to be able to drive traffic to our site. But that even though we were, that traffic was most likely not a mom looking for photo sharing sites. So that's another thing we have to keep in mind that when you do those kinds of testing, you might be testing a different thing altogether. It's still useful to test whether someone prefers one version or another. But in our case, we weren't even testing with the actual users of the system. And that's something that, that kind of um, was surprising for us as well. So this is a case where you can, you can do qualitative learning and get to a conclusive result much, much quicker than to make it quantitatively. And the reason that is is because we were doing very bold um, change from one version to the other. We were just changing the color of these things, you know, changing from red to blue to a different color altogether. That's more of an optimization exercise. And those are things that you can do quantitatively and kind of move on and see what happens over time. Because at that point, you know what's going to necessarily point that out, or, or it may not be that conclusive. So hopefully that illustrates how you can kind of draw that line sometimes between the two. So coming back to this one, so the, so the version that I put on there was just faster way to share photos and potentially it morphed into the, the get back to your more important thing in your life faster. And the high level process, we, we still kept it as a no uploading because we saw that was the word that we didn't want to own. But unfortunately, it was the word that caused more confusion when once people understood the product, it was something they could, they could remember it by. And so we kept that in the high level concept because we still ended with that when we interviewed people. And when they explained it to somebody else, they would explain them their way and kind of say, well, it's kind of normal for me as well. So that was just a convenient way to get there. So coming to the solution box, <coughs> so I mentioned earlier on how, we, how this is not what Rick thinks about your startup typically. And not just that, but at this point, you have a whole kind of list of untested problems. You're not even sure if those are the problems you're going to be addressing. And so it's important not to spend a lot of time on the solution box just yet, because a lot of that can change. And so instead, you want to outline a possible solution or a list of features for each one of those problems. So let's just jump right into the example that we did to share that with. So for, for the sharing in time constraints that we have this no upload type of uh, sharing thing, that's what I just list out there, just as one liner of what we're going to do. Also, because, it, because there's um, because most people have their uh, content on their, their desktops, we, we built some integration into iPhoto and folder sharing, so it made it easier. So that was another way we were going to save them time. And then one of the things we also saw people spend a lot of time doing is reorganizing their photos. So we said rather than reorganizing, we could just we just use the data that's in the photo already to build a timeline view automatically for them. So we just sort it just based on what's in the folder. So they don't have to organize. So those are just three things we listed based on the problem we had, which is no time, no lots of demand, and, and sharing in time consuming. We came up with those three features. And as we interviewed more people, some of these problems actually changed. And as, as a result of that, one of the things that came up uh, pretty high on the list was the fear of losing all their photos. So it was some sort of a backup. And since we were already 
the cashier is doing something here, so why not, why not make this be also a backup service? So that was something that got added on um, just after the interview that became part of the MVP. So it's a way that, that shows why, why it's not sometimes the best thing to jump into building. Even though these things, these problems make sense, they can still change after this computer interview. Any questions so far? So let's talk a little bit about channels. So again, I, I had many side conversations on, on channels of links. So I mentioned how you know, very early on there are some real risks that startups face. My top three risks that I try to mitigate is the kind of startups that I build. The first is around problem, which I think is universal. If everyone needs to find a problem worth solving. So you want to find who the customer is and what problems they have, and do they know they have those problems, and do they want them solved. And the second thing is building paths to customers. So how are you going to reach those? How are you going to reach those customers? And that is the second risk case scenario that I see, and where most startups stumble later on. So you can actually follow this process. You can go and find 10 or 20 people. You know, they can tell you the, the features they want, the product they want. You can build the MVP. You can even get paid for it. But you, you might still get a wall because you have no way of reaching people beyond that. So you cannot go out and talk to every customer you sign up. And so you get into this, into this problem that we, we talk about. Here, which is how you build a scalable channel beyond that point. So, channel is the next thing you have to start really testing and identifying. The third risk here that I, I talked about, which is, which is coming, is revenue streams or money. How are you going to make money for the business? So, pricing is another one of those things that people think of just defer, not really <coughs> test, but it's something you have to test much sooner because it's one of those riskier areas that, um, that, that you want to tackle first. <coughs> So let's talk about some ways um, of building channels. So I'll just bring some of these all out. I'll bring all these out. So first thing I do, because I don't quite know who the customers really will be, is I want to invest um, just more of freer channels versus paid channels. And so the reason I say freer and not just free is that there's no such thing as a free channel. So even things like social media require a lot of human capital to tweet every day or to write blogs every day. And if you have to do the ROI on them, they're like, it's very hard to calculate because there are things that give over time. So I have some blog posts that get read a year after they've been written and drive traffic to some of my products, but there's no way for me to adjust the process. There's no way for me to get on that as a year ago. So it's very hard to calculate the ROI. But I do still invest in trying to build more cheaper channels um, earlier than, than trying to do like big ads uh, on sites or trying to do big events or things like that. Um, the other thing is focusing more on over time, on inbound versus outbound. So an, an example of an inbound channel would be things like social media or blogs where, where people, where customers actually come and find you. An outbound channel is where you are doing kind of an outreach program to try to find people. An example of outbound channels would be things like radio, TV, you know, events, trade shows, things like that, where you're, where you're, pushing, where you're trying to push the message out. But they all tend to be expensive ones, so I tend to avoid them. So one exception there is interviews. So interviews is a part of the outbound channel. So you are going out and trying to find these people. But there, the reason that is justified is because of the learning you get. So interviewing people and talking to customers face to face is the fastest way to learn, which is why I have number three and four. So I prefer, whenever possible, early on to do more direct channels, which is talking to customers versus trying to automate them or going in direct. And so by automate, I mean, like, even in my in this example with the photo sharing site, this was not going to be a direct sales channel. I was not going to go and sell this to every mom. But I did that because that was the only way I could learn. And that, that landing page example illustrated that. It was a very fast way to learn with them. And once I made it work with a handful of them, I then tweaked that landing page and want and needed it to scale and be self-serve. So it was going to be automated eventually. The other thing with direct versus indirect is when I talk a lot of um, Founders, many of them feel like they're not good at selling. They actually just go and hire a salesperson to do it. And if there are salespeople in the room, I'll be the first to admit that, that you can probably outsell any, any entrepreneur in, in, in the room provided you're, you're given a sales process. If you have a sales process, salespeople can go execute on that process. So the problem is that when you're starting out, you don't quite even know who the customers are. You don't quite even know what it is you're selling. A lot of it is learning as you go. And so for that, you actually need to be more, um, it, 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 it needs to be more the founders that are doing that kind of interviewing, that kind of learning. And so things that we talk about in, that our customers tell 
development type of things, customer development type of things, cannot really be outsourced. The founders have to be in those meetings. So when we're talking about the problem solution team, the founders have to, in every case, be in that problem team. So they have to be out there talking to the customers. They don't necessarily even have to be building the solution, but they have to be hearing from customers what the problem is. And the, the final point is retention over, over referral. Because I see a lot of, um, especially web startups, that try to build in things like virality or referrals into their product way too early. So I remember my, my first use of Twitter, and Twitter was a really popular event, so this is not necessarily a, a, a hit on them, but as soon as I signed up, I was being asked to call all my friends into Twitter so that I could, so they could use it. I didn't know what this thing was. And so it would be almost like going to a coffee shop and trying to buy a cup of coffee and just don't even pay for it and them telling you to go and tell all your friends about how great that coffee shop was. So it's kind of sound absurd and that's pretty much what you're asking them to do on your website. So I typically, so, so this is an example of and why it actually works fine, is that the referral is a very powerful trigger, but you want to push it once you've got a target that people are using and that they want. Trying to worry too much about that early on is, is, a, is a form of waste. So any questions on these guys? Channels or how you, I know there's some questions that we're about how we build channels, and hopefully this answers some of that. Okay. Like this particular example, I, I did, I, when I first did this, I did this AdWords on here because I thought that would be a viable channel. And after I talked to uh, Mom, I realized that they don't have to search for the stuff, we can really do that out. But that's an example of how that gets tested. Um, other ones that did actually work out for us were Facebook. Um, and Facebook, not in terms of Facebook ads, but actually using Facebook and, and sharing their, their their galleries and their albums with people on there. And then word of mouth was another one that um, that worked quite well. Something we discovered in the interviews, but also things that we got moms to help spread um, word about this particular product. Yeah, well, I, I
people were not quite sure that the program was still being used. So the person in charge of the accounts just kept paying because it felt like a business expense. So they just kept paying for it. So it's, it's, it's very easy to get, to get into this situation sometimes where you might actually be, be, be making money, you might actually be paying revenue, but if you are not measuring usage around that revenue, it can be a false positive. So that the retention is, is a much better indicator of building something people want than just purely building revenue. Any questions on pricing? So how do you set your initial price? So pricing is a hard topic, and there's more art than science. So there's a book here that I recommend a lot of people want to show the dice. It's a free ebook that you can download. Um, it does talk about software pricing, but a lot of the, the principles and, and, and techniques there apply to really many different kinds of products. I still recommend it for people who are not doing software. Um, but one of the things that I particularly use over the time of the is pricing one of the two alternatives. Remember in the problem interviews I said early on, you have two objectives. You're going out there and you're trying to understand um, who your customers are, what problems they have. So that's the first objective. You're, you're trying to rank those problems in terms of must-haves or nice to have. But then the second most important thing that you're trying to do is understanding how to solve those problems today. And by understanding that, really understanding your workflow, you basically get to the existing alternatives and then you can price against them. Because if they're using a free product, then you have to have something that's way better than free to be able to justify paying for it. And if they're using a very expensive product, um, then it actually gives you permission to anchor against them, whether you want to go lower or higher. So this is a reference point that my experience to use. And so when it comes to pricing, I typically in the beginning like to keep it simple. I don't like to have you know, hundreds of different plans and options. I like to keep it simple so I know who my customer is. Um, and even though I may want to go to enterprises and small businesses and all these different things down the road, I want to pick where, where I'd like to start. So I pick that one type of customer, pick that one price, and then start testing with that. And so you can test again qualitatively with your interview based on what people will say they'll, they'll buy. And then we later on verify that by what they actually do. And again, raising the bar early on when people say what they'll buy, trying to get them to prepay or do pre-orders like I did with the book or with our, our techniques of, of really testing that sooner rather than just taking it purely on on a on phrase or word of mouth on on a just letter of or word of mouth. And so now we're here in terms of um, I think based on our interviews, we did find a lot of people were using email, but they did see some of the benefits that the product would have over um, say email, like not being able to send more than a handful of pictures and some of the other benefits. But we really tried relative to some of the competitors that were out here. So things like Flickr Pro and Magma, they were priced in the $30 to $50 price range. Um, even Apple had a product with a $99 price range. So we decided we were going to start at $49. And right now that's where we're going to start and we can figure out uh, how we set that price later on. So we just kept it simple and started there. And on this side of the equation, we want to list again what are some of your immediate costs. So I'm not again looking at what my office is going to cost me six months from now, what my furniture is going to cost me. I'm looking at what my immediate needs are. For us at that point, we're just hosting and people build the MVP up. And what that cost would be, and then from there drawing a break even point in terms of the number of customers I would need to make this model work. And so this is quite quite a few thousand customers, then then my 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 outflow kind of matches my inflow, and I would say it's broken even. So what's getting there is the sunk cost. And so I have to then figure out how I'm going to pay for this, whether it's through my own savings, whether I have to raise a small seed round, whether I can do it just on the weekend, which is quite actually you know, is nice. So however that is, those are all things that you have to then decide on how you how you weigh this model. And I might have a different model. Early on when you do the brainstorming, this is 2,000 customers for this model. I was selling this today to a different market, which we learned all to test in the financial photographer market. They were able to charge not $49, but $149 to $200. So that was um, you know, potentially four times the price, and so it would be one fourth the number of customers we would need to, to, to acquire to reach that break even point. And so then we kind of weighed it aside and said, well, can we reach those, those customers more effectively than the bonds? And so that's how you kind of weigh which ones you may want to start with. Um, similarly, if you're going out to enterprise, if, if this is a product an, an, an enterprise to you might just need one enterprise customer to get there. So that could be a six month sales cycle. So you have to kind of bring all of those things into play and decide which ones you really want to start with. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit about key metrics. So every business has these key numbers that tell you how your business is doing in real time. But one 
was sort of this report in the region about uh, this one person who was actually putting the economy based on how many um, hardware boxes were being ordered from his, his warehouse. So he was one of the big suppliers to Amazon and many of the retailers. And usually in the top market, people buy a lot. And so just by this cardboard order, he can tell which economy is doing well. And you can sometimes predict that faster than what the economy actually does. So when the orders start going down, you can tell we're going into a recession. So that's how powerful the key numbers can be. But even in business, we have power business, we have some key numbers that help drive that. So this, uh, this is um, data through a star of metrics. Anyone, some, everyone, anyone seeing this? Some people. So this is data through uh, startup metrics or pilot metrics. We didn't call pilot metrics but because if you look at the first letter on each of the macro events, they spell the word R, uh, which is the word the pirates like to use. But I like to call pirate metrics. And so even though I came from the startup world and particularly software, I find the model works for, for many different types of businesses. So I'll illustrate it away. So just using a flower shop and also the startup website. So Essentially, what this shows is show the conversion funnel or your customer life cycle. So let's, let's assume we had a, a flower shop in, uh, in, in downtown Brussels. And um, the, the, the first event on their acquisition would be measured by somebody walking down the street, seeing something inside the store, stopping it, and then taking the action of coming inside. That's an acquired prospect. As somebody who was unaware of your store just a minute ago, they saw your store and came inside. Now you have an acquisition event. So on your landing page, when people hit your landing page from wherever, if they leave the database, they don't click anything, they leave immediately as somebody who just bounced because they probably got there accidentally. But if they stop and click around or scan for them, typically this number will use 30 seconds on their, on their website, then you have an acquired customer. You may not have bought anything, but you at least have brought your attention for 30 seconds. <coughs> and the next step up is activation. So this would be them having a, a first good experience with your product or with your store. So if they come inside your flower shop and they see everything in disarray, all your flowers are dying and uh, the store is up as a mess and what was outside is a mess, what's inside, that would be a bad user experience and they probably will leave and never come back. So you have to make sure that connects very well. So similarly on your product website, if your landing page had a particular promise and then they went to sign it up and the colors just changed, it went from this pretty website to being this really kind of dodgy looking <laughs> sign up page. Um, that's an example of again not connecting with what you promised. So, so being able to make that be, be seamless and, and, and a good experience all the way through is what we call activation. Reaching that point where the customer can kind of realize the unique value proposition or at least understand it is, is, uh, is what that activation event is measure. And then retention is really measuring people coming back. So in a flower shop, whether they would come back um, you know, the next week, a month, three months, whatever that frequency is from your product, it's just the fact that they're coming back, similarly on the product website, when they come back and use it. And then revenue is, again, simple, it's just how you make money. So whether they buy a flower shop on that particular day or some other time, on your product website, whether they're buying things, subscriptions, whatever that ends up being. And then referral is just telling other people about your product. So flower shop, whether they tell their friends, this is a great flower shop, you should go buy gifts, this is old school, but that's great flower shop. Same thing with the product website. If they like it, they'll you know, all kinds of affiliate viral applications over time. <coughs> so here I love this stuff. And again, here focus is important. I mentioned early on how acquisition is something that you don't really want to be optimizing early on. First thing you want to do is make sure you're building something people want. So the core product market says the two metrics that really matter are activation and retention. You want to make sure that people have a great first year experience with our product. And it's more important than even activation, that's the first step, but that they come back and use the product. So, so something that we like to talk a lot about in the lean startup is something we talk about as vanity metrics. And those are things that make us feel good, but they don't necessarily mean our product is doing well. So I'm just going to use Skype as an example. When Skype came out on their, on their website, they were in big bold letters, they were, they were counting how many people had downloaded their product. That's a form of a vanity metric. So even though it's impressive that they got a million downloads, the more interesting number is how many people were actually using it after that initial download. Because I think you can get people to download your website or your product, but will they come back and use it again on the basis of downloading it? So the more important number, again, is retention that we want to measure over time. <coughs> and I put revenue here in, in dotted form because it's not, again, it's, it's a proxy retention. If you are charging for your product, 
the two ships could marry each other for the most part. The people are doing these products and they're charging for it. They're not going to be paying for it. Uh, but even if you're not charging for a product something like a Twitter pay, retention is still a way for you to measure whether you build something of value or not. And then after part of our discipline, our, our focus then shifts from the value metrics. So acquisition retention would be what I call value metrics to our growth metrics. So growth metrics are things like acquisition. So how do we drive more people into a product on the top? These are new users that we go and acquire through other channels, or the same channel is optimized. And then referral would be how do we use our existing happy users to feed people to the top again? So whether it's with a building program or viral program or then just telling other people about how great the product is. So encouraging those kinds of behaviors are things that we start to, once we know we have a product that people that actually like and love. So any questions on the referral community? How do you measure it other than implicitly on the website? You know, your, your flower uh, for example is even harder. You know, you don't always try and say, oh, by the way, your friends, you know, maybe, right, maybe but even, sure, but, but even there, so there are, if you wanted to measure, there are sure. things like a coupon or, or a card you can give out to people. Um, so there are like some, there are some ways for you to, to measure. So you know, it could be something you give 10% off to five friends and they get 10% off and you know, they have it. So there, there are things you can do to see if that thing that people even do. Now on the web, on things like our website, they're actually easier to track. If you can try almost anything just based on what people are doing on the website. And so when they come to sign up in their referral code from there, people give, people give out referral codes in some cases. Um, if you're using social media, we, 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 can, we can track the, kind of the, the, the click back rate based on <coughs> people tweeting out or just the fact that they are tweeting in general. Um, yeah, well, if you uh, try to get your referral data by giving out coupons, which actually kind of drive like to the free customer, you know, you're, you're writing your sermon there, right? They, they were actually could be that, oh, it's cheaper rather than the recommendation of the friend. The pure version would be no, no cut price, but just the friend. Just the friend, yeah. I agree. I agree. And, so, and there, are, there are some, I know when I got my, I got my, one of my calls, had canceling things, and one of the things I had done is put like five cards you could give out to your friend. And so then there was no discount. It was just, I love this card so much that I'm going to give it to these people. And it did have a code on there. I know you could give them some benefit, but it wasn't price. So on here, the, so on, on the on the key metrics here, I, I use that um, I, I use the activation and retention as being what guides what I build on here. So the first thing we want to really measure when people come and use the site is what they're able to have a, 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 a pleasurable experience. We want to make sure they can actually download the product, they can actually download the product. So the download is not enough. We want to make sure they actually create something, they actually share it across galleries. And so that was that first metric we were measuring and people would sign up but they hit that first one that would be the activation point. And then after that we wanted to measure repeated usage. So how often were they sharing content? So when you know, they were sharing photo albums even once a week or every other week or videos a video if they stop sharing at some point the value of the product goes down they probably will stop paying totally out. So when that sharing decline we would do things to like encourage them to share like send them an email out or we you know, encourage them to come back to the product uh, before they about that point where they said and then this is an example of something like a referral where sometimes when you have products where these are built in, I don't necessarily call them as referrals because I define referrals as bringing in potential new customers into the system, which these can become. But the reason that this is on there is because um, there are multiple users here. So parents, by nature, <coughs> they're building this product just for themselves. Again, it would have limited use. We want to encourage them to share it out at least with their close family. So we would track that as well. And if they weren't doing it, we would and pinch them to go ahead and share the galleries with other people. So that's like in this particular case, we weren't so much measuring the fact that those people came back from the screen, but more importantly that these parents right now were actually doing it. We're actually sending the emails out to people. And then we would close the loop with them later on. Until you reach a point where uh, where you have a certain sale, and once you need enough sale, then you start paying. 
kind of look at what are your true unfair advantages and how they're defensible over time. And anything worth, worth um, copying, you want to copy it, especially as you get closer to our market trends. Even if you think you have no competitors today, um, first of all, there always are competitors in the form of existing alternatives. So people might be using email versus the whole thing. But say you build a great product and you start getting traction, chances are people will copy exactly what you're doing and try to enter the market. So you have to have some defense against that. And so that's why this is here. This is a very hard box to sell, but it's here. It's, it's actually okay many times it's even possible to leave it completely blank because you don't quite know what your unfair advantage is. But it's something that develops and it builds over time. So some of these might even be aspirational or value driven. So a good example there is Zappos. So when Zappos not only started, but when Tony Shea came on as a CEO, he believed very heavily in happiness, creating happiness for everyone around him, customers as well as employees. And he did a lot of things which were, um, again, if you look at it from a business perspective, it didn't make a whole lot of business sense. So he had a policy of allowing his customer service representatives to do whatever was required to make customers happy. Which, and, and the longest log call was in somewhere close to six hours, where somebody was on the phone with somebody trying to help them because they had a rare form of a, of a foot problem where the shoes kept falling off. And so they were just working through ways they could work around that and looking up things online for them. And he even had a event with his co founder that he could get the, one of the customer service representatives to order some pizza. So they called him anonymously, and sure enough, they got him to order some pizza. And there was no question to ask, ask they just ordered it in from the phone. So, so he had yeah, those kind of policies there, and other things like 365 days, return policies, two way shipping, and things like that, which on the surface sound like, why would anyone do this? They can't run a business this way. But that was what kind of became their unfair advantage over time. They built a huge. Um, loyal customer base was very vocal and had a big part in their eventual acquisition by Amazon for 1.2 or 1.9 billion dollars. So where is the life because it's the same same regime in place. Some commitment, some loyalty with them, 
they're not only a great source for you to learn, but they also will kind of uh, stay with you and, and stick with you. So that can be an unfair advantage if you get enough of them over time. Okay. All right. So once you have once you have these models down, um, well, what we then do is put them side by side and we prioritize them. So I'll talk about kind of this four-step prioritization. So the first thing that we are looking for is the customer pain level. Because I've got two models side by side, I want to see whether one particular model has has kind of more pain than the other. So, so even in this particular case, taking someone like a wedding photographer or graphic designer, all these people putting them around, putting them aside, and based on my assumptions of what they would pay you, I see I can rank them based on that. So that's the first criteria that I use. The second thing is ease of reach. So I mentioned how it's very important, it's easy to get stuck not being able to reach enough people. So if you do have some customers that you can reach more easily than others, definitely start there, even though that may not be the big business plan that you build. All things being considered, it's better to start learning somewhere. So even if I can put my product in front of someone and have them derive value, I can then figure out how to build channels to take it somewhere else. But I still want to start at learning with customers as soon as possible. So try to prioritize that to the next, the next level. And then the, the next few things here are more around kind of the, the business model and the market size. So on pricing, I mentioned how just treating the customer can change the pricing completely, whether I go to a wedding photographer or a, or a mom. And so I would use that as a criteria to, to figure out which one I may want to pick first. Because initially our, our bigger challenge is, is survival, is getting the startup off the ground than it is and slowly scaling it. So I want to figure out what is, that, what is the shortest path to get there. And then based on the, the, the eventual goal of the startup, so what is that market size? So if the uh, mom's too small a market, should I be looking bigger? Am I narrowing myself to some little questions you want to ask yourself and figure out if that's the market you want to pursue or not? And then kind of a fifth and a sixth one that I would put on there. The fifth one certainly is would be technical feasibility. Because it's possible, to, I, I mentioned early on that you don't want to spend too much time worrying about the technical solution. But sometimes it is possible for you to go into a meeting and kind of get carried away and promise the world to people. And so there is a reality check that you have to impose on yourself to see whether what you're saying you can build can actually do. Because the, the technology exists and it's not an impossible, it's not going to take you a year to do. So those are things that you will have to kind of bring into check. So technical feasibility. And the last thing I would put on there is also your passion for the problem. Um, so I, I find a lot of entrepreneurs that get super passionate. I was one of them as well. My first startup I built around a problem, but that problem didn't quite end up being uh, a, a big enough problem that we could solve. Um, so we, we had what we were left with was some technology, and we used that technology looking for other problems to go solve. And I really love the technology as well, the peer to peer stuff. And I had a huge, I, I, I guess I had, had more passion at some point for that technology than the eventual products we built which became a problem over time, because after a while it's, it's hard. Every startup is a roller coaster, and for you to be able to survive all the way, you have to kind of love what you're doing, you have to love your customers, and you have to love the mission of what it is you're doing. And so if you're just in love with building solutions, you can go ahead and do that in doing a lot of other things, but if you don't have that passion for the problems of the customer, then it becomes harder to kind of keep going for a longer time. So I do find that as being something. So when looking at customers, you can get very, that scientific and say, I'll go after attorneys, but if you hate attorneys, maybe you don't want to go after attorneys. But, but if you don't want to hang out with them, or you don't want to hear from them and be in their world, then you probably don't want to go there. So it, that's another thing that I will, I will kind of throw out there, which is something that I learned. So part of it that I also sold my business was partly because of that, is that I had, had built this technology and I was looking for all these different um, markets, and some of them were viable. We, we actually, um, had some really success in the mom market, but then I sold it to, to um, I sold this business to somebody else who actually was more the, the um, I would say the, the, the better fit for taking that company forward. So I wasn't really as passionate either about photography or hanging out with moms for that long of a period of time and becoming the the, the the face of the company. So I felt it had to be someone else. So that was a case where one was a great business model and it could actually work. I didn't want to keep doing it myself. So that's where I can have that problem passion beyond the initial stage. And the thing about, about market size is that the uh, scaling, I can imagine that it can help be either or. You're talking about moms and then also potential market experience, wedding photographers, graphic designers, but 
Could there be a question where you have to choose among the fans? You couldn't have them all because there could be a reputation that, oh, this is, this is sort of common people software, this is, this is sort of stupid software, and it's a web card versus the one used to do sort of an image. Yeah. And, you know, oh, I heard about the way the reference is made of my eyes, actually, that if this is the way everyone else is done, then I won't be able to charge that. So, you, in effect, you could be able to choose one or the other, which which uh, part you could be go after. And then, so, so in, in our particular case, what we did is we actually printed two landing pages that were completely disconnected. And we actually called one, so we, we kept the same name, we called it Cloudfire and Cloudfire Pro. So they had two separate landing pages. And the reason that we actually did that in parallel is because it was the same exact product. We just kind of put a new spin on the, on the market. Like what were the top two problems were different for moms and for wedding photographers, but they were using the same exact product. And over time, the wedding photographers pushed us towards building more features and model pushers towards picking, building others. And so that's where we had to make a decision sort of which one we wanted. But, but like I mentioned, how it's right. working, you can go in parallel for a while, but at some point, you, you have to yeah. have to do that. Yeah. 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 Well, you do you're sort of perpetrating a somewhat of a product or what? I mean, that's a strong language, but I mean, you're sort of, it's sort of like having two girlfriends, right? You know, one of them actually went a lot better about the other, and then they all hell break this, right? Uh, yeah, but, but, but I like her. Sure. But, but I think that this was also not as much of a stretch because, so, so like Spotify, for example, they actually were doing exactly the same thing where they had a, a, a free version, which was not a free version, but a, a consumer version and a pro version. Uh -huh. So in this case, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, but I can see a certain market absolutely where, where you're trying to, you know, at some point you have to pick, pick your, your customer. You know, there's a, for example, the Tesla market, where at one point the Tesla was great for handicapped people. Right, you can see that there's the uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, actually useful to Yeah. Any other questions, Yeah. I have a small question about the um, you're talking about the market size. And I was wondering, um, maybe then the slide starts on uh, the desktop. Uh, I was wondering about the, 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 the size of the selling pipeline. In, uh, on the web, it's probably uh, like a few hours from the discovery of the website to buying decision. Well, well if, if it's over, yeah. um, or maybe even uh, minutes. But it, is it a case of more uh, business to business kind of platform, or is it all technology oriented startups? Uh, what do you think about the, the length of this? Uh, for, from the initial lead to the, the conclusion of the contract with the big company, for example? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so there, there are different there, there are different um, sales cycles. And I'll say that even on the web, like if you do a premium model, you can go into situations where a lot of companies are because people stay on free for a very long time or even sometimes forever. And so in the book, I particularly write about how personally, like I, I prefer free trials early on because if, if you think about it, they actually create a very they, they create a time box customer life cycle. At the end of 30 days, the customer has to decide. Did they get value or not? Are they going to pay or not? And I'd much rather learn that sooner than you know, six months out and then do things for free and then one day I say, well, aren't you going to pay? And I'm like, I'm never going to pay. Right? So I want my question. So I would say that the web stuff you can't get in that long cycle. Now, certainly when you're doing more business to business stuff, it's just the nature of, of the beast that you are going to have that long sales cycle. But the reason that, that it works at there is because hopefully what you're selling, what you're selling at the end of it, is worth all that work. So there is a big cost, there's a big ticket item at the end of it. And that's what makes it worthwhile. So that is why you have to think about if that is the channel you're going to use. Um, but you can still use, and that's the book that Steve Lines wrote about, is he has, um, he describes kind of the B2B enterprise selling process. And a lot of these techniques are applied there. So if you are in that space, I would highly, if you haven't thought that book, I highly recommend it. But he, he talks about um, just the process of, you know, how to go through these interviews, Initially, you, you can, can do a broad scope where you are, a, a broad sweep where you're looking for um, just anyone in the organization to talk to. But at some point, again, you have to narrow down and figure out who the influencers are, who the decision makers are on the map of the organization. And then you have to have different different value propositions for different departments. So when you talk to the CIO, it's one message. When you talk to the IT department, they have different worldviews, views, different concerns. So you have to sell them on a different thing. Uh, but there's a whole process to like doing that. It is a long cycle, but the point that you need one one big customer to put you in the game, and then their validation helps you bring other people on. Uh, so I don't know if that answers that question. Or that, but. Uh, 